In the last three months, it has been all gain and no pain for large cap stocks. But the strongest stocks at the end of last week were looking like they were about to falter. But after an upbeat QRA announcement, that all changed. The quarterly borrowing estimate came in below expectations. And while the treasury is still issuing a record amount of debt, it's not nearly as much as the market was pricing in. And this led to an everything rally, including bonds, which saw huge dark pool activity. And we need to talk about what that means for yields moving forward. So with the S&P 500 closing at another all-time high, let's talk about stocks and the financial markets together. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Daily Recap Show, where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. We do these videos every single week, giving you the most concise and in-depth recaps on stocks and the financial markets. So if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. Like this video. Let's get into it. It's never a dull day in the market. I woke up to so much trading view notifications about Google and Meta breaking certain prices as well as Visa, but it was quite the day today. We got some very big announcements. We're going to talk about all of that, but the star standout of today, you could say it was semiconductors, but really it was software application. And it wasn't just like this part in technology, software proxy stocks, Look at PayPal, look at Airbnb right here. They did very, very well. So software put up a good day. I mean, it, there was pretty muted action in financials, stuff like energy and the bigger names in healthcare didn't quite participate, but buying across the board and breath was actually quite fantastic. 372 gainers in the S&P 500, about 138 losers, something like that. So, and it wasn't just thin leadership at the top. Now we got the latest sentiment poll. It's out the next 100 points in the S&P 500. What do you guys think it's going to be? 59% of you said down, 41% of you said up. And fun fact about this, out of the five times that we've had bearish sentiment, the Monday has actually opened higher four out of those five times. So this could be a contrarian indicator for Monday's open, just something to go off there. We did get 369 votes. So I guess you could say it's quite significant, although a thousand would be much better. Now looking at sectors, what were the best performance software? Very strong day and there were a bunch of software names, not necessarily in the S&P 500, but just in the market that reported earnings today. One of them was FFIV. They were up like eight, nine percent in after hours. Very strong earnings across the board. Regional banks put up a good day, especially with the refunding announcement. Financials too. And I mean, the only sector that was down on the day was energy. Other than that, positive across the board. And to be honest, I think energy was just giving a back some of the 4% gains it made last week. Now looking at the majors, and it wasn't just the S&P 500, small caps outperformed as well as RSP, the broader market. Bonds like what the treasury announced as well. It was just a broad based buying and it happened like towards the end of the day, 3 p.m., literally a gap up and rally. Great breath across the board. Now looking at some stats for the month ahead, this is the February barometer. And pretty much if the last quarter, October 27th to Jan 27th is greater than 5%, the returns we can expect from Jan 27th to Feb 15th, pretty much about 11 trading days. And we've had a quarter, which is pretty much 18%, 18.78%. And on average, the return after a positive trailing quarter is 2.3% from Jan 27th to Feb 15th, 21 up years, five down years. And this is actually a really good parameter for the weeks ahead because in the 12 years where, because in the 12 years where October to Jan 27th, it should say January was negative, Jan 27th to Feb 15th. So it's five winners, seven losses, average return 0.43% loss. So pretty much if the quarter is negative, this time period is negative. If it's positive, it's likely we go positive. Nothing is guaranteed. Right now, momentum is on the side of the bulls. But just because momentum is on our side, does that mean the S&P 500 is a buy? Well, let's look at relative valuation. Is the S&P 500 cheap or expensive? And based on the historical average in almost every single metric, the S&P 500 is expensive. Everything from trailing PE, forward PE, price to earnings growth, EV to sales, in almost every single instance except ERP, which is equity risk premium, the S&P 500 is expensive. Now, one thing that was extremely positive for the market was the QRA. Pretty much the treasury said that our borrowing estimates for the second quarter is $55 billion under the expectation. We were expecting 805. 
we got 750 billion and the market seemed to like this. Now, this is one part of the QRA announcement on Wednesday. Pre-market, they will release the composition. So pretty much where they're gonna position this $750 billion inside the curve. Is it gonna be in the belly of the curve, the longer end of the curve, or the shorter end of the curve? So pretty much, is it gonna be the bills, the notes, or the bonds? And uh, in my personal opinion, I think Yellen is gonna continue to go for the bonds and notes because there seems to be good appetite for this part of the curve. Now, based on this, what does Goldman Sachs expect? Goldman Sachs are still expecting five rate cuts in 2024. They are expecting three consecutive cuts of 25 basis points in March, May, June, and then 25 basis point cuts every other meeting or once per quarter all the way to 2025, where they see the federal funds rate at 3.25 to 3.5%. And that's very bullish for equities because equities tend to struggle when rates rise by two standard deviations in a month. You can see here that rates rising rates falling. Generally speaking, when rates fall, equities rally. When rates increase, equities don't rally. And this is even more sensitive for stuff like Russell 2000. Look at today, the IWM was the best performing major. And that's because rates fell significantly on the QRA news. Now let's talk about GDP guys. I showed you guys this last week, fourth quarter GDP came in at 3.3%. The majority of it was consumer spending and non-residential investment. Now I do want to talk about this as well as consumer spending and look at the GDP for this quarter and what we can expect. Because I do think that this is important in regards to will we get into a recession or will we avoid a recession. Now, according to Goldman Sachs, non-residential investment, which is this right here, CapEx, is actually going to be equal to consumer spending. Goldman Sachs do predict 2.5% in consumer spending and CapEx. While they may be a bit more bullish, if you actually have a look at what the consensus is, it's roughly the same. So CapEx and consumer spending is going to have the same GDP weight in the next GDP print. So it's very important that non-residential investment is something we look at and see where the money is going and what are the expectations for that for this quarter. Goldman Sachs expects business investment to rise 2.5% in 2024, despite a drag from structures. Now, structures is this right here. So the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act from the third quarter 2024. Now IRA and the CHIPS Act is going to be a drag on structures in 2024-25. But other than that, non-residential investment as a whole should increase 2.5% in 2024 and then further in 2025. And fading structures investment should be offset by an increase in equipment investment for new factories that now appear to be underway. So all of the onshoring we're seeing, a lot of that investment is going to offset structures investment, as you can see right here. So there's a lot of capital investment happening onshoring. So manufacturers coming back to country, to Australia, to America, simply because of what happened with the COVID situation. And this is going to be a tailwind for the economy in 2024, 2025. Now, moving away from the hard data in regards to non-residential investment, something we're seeing, this was an article by the Wall Street Journal for retailers, business is back and landlords say no more to rent discounts simply because economy is good, the consumer is strong and there's demand coming back for commercial real estate. If there was one thing that was going to cripple the economy, it's commercial real estate and especially with the amount of commercial real estate that banks have exposure to. So this is a really, really good thing. To see this happening is really, really bullish for landlords and like regional banks. Adding on to that, something we're seeing, the average mention of weak demand per company for consumer sectors actually moving lower. Do expect this to continue into 2024, especially if the consumer remains strong and the economy remains robust. Now let's actually talk about the consumer and consumer spending. Now this is what Goldman Sachs expects 2024 real income growth to be on a quarter over quarter basis. And let's have a look at it. They expect 1% in real wage gains, 0.9% in job gains, 1% in interest income. All of this right here, other transfers, Medicaid and other equate to a 0.3% gain for a total gain of 3.2% in real income for 2024. So real incomes grow, inflation goes down, and this is really, really good for the consumer because real incomes are increasing as inflation right here is decreasing. So you can see a 3.2% increase in real incomes in 2023 as we've had a decrease in the inflation rate. And this is gonna continue into 2024. As you can see, a decrease in inflation, real income increase, very, very bullish. And this is why the consumer continues to remain strong 
and will continue to remain strong. Now, let's actually have a look at earnings. This is a consumer driven economy. And if earnings are good, it means the consumers are good. And this is Bofa's notes straight off their trade desk. 124 S&P 500 companies, 30% of the index reported earnings. While consensus fourth quarter EPS is tracking a meet versus expectation at the start of January, reported EPS is coming 5% above consensus led by financials and industrials. Those are the reported sales and the EPS beats. They're better than the historical average. So you can see that this is EPS beats, sales beats, beat on both. Reactions to beats have been more muted, however, versus the historical average because a lot of investors are looking at forward guidance. But our one month guidance ratio improved to 0.6x versus 0.25 as of last week. Although weaker on an absolute level, this is exactly in line with the January historical average. Now this is for the S&P 500. Very, very bullish. I mean, these larger companies are doing very well in the market, the US market, the global market. But let's have a look at small caps. So far, 105 of the 600 small cap companies have reported. Fourth quarter consensus earnings are 2.5% above where they stood at the start of January, while sales are 0.3% lower at the start of January. Financials and the material sectors have seen the most positive earnings, while real estate and energy have seen the largest downward revisions. 62% of companies beat on EPS, 32% beat on sales, 15% on both. And analysts are forecasting, however, small cap earnings to be negative 13% year over year. So even though we're beating on EPS, it's still down on a year over year basis. So let's have a look at sectors as a whole. This is very interesting. 17 tech companies have reported 94% EPS beats, 71% sale beats. Very interesting. Let's have a look at healthcare. Seven have reported 57% EPS beats, 100% sales beats. So they're beating on actual like revenue on sales, but there's just a little bit of expenses, you know, they're spending too much. And that's why only 57% are beating on EPS and sales and EPS as a whole. Now I do want to keep an eye on, on discretionary. Now it has says nine companies have reported 67 7% EPS beats. But I think if this was weighted in market cap weight to Amazon Tesla, I think this would be a lot lower in terms of actual dollar value to earnings per share as a whole. Now look at this materials, right? About a quarter of the materials industry has reported earnings, 83% EPS beats, 100% sales beats. There's a lot of strength in material sector. And I would love to see what this looks like at the end of the week. All in all, the S&P 500, 73% EPS beats, 65% on sales, 51% on both. Based on the fourth quarter historical EPS revision average, we are kind of tracking in line. You don't want to look at the level. You want to look at the trend. The trend tends to be up. We'll see if this continues. Now looking at small cap earnings, this is the S&P 500. It's not looking good. I mean, on a year over year basis, negative 12.7%. We spoke about this already. Now 62% are beating EPS, 32 are beating sales, 15% are beating on both, but it's still a beat on a year over year decline. So instead of decline, declining like 10%, they're declining like 9%. That's pretty much what, what that is saying. So until small caps fix up their earnings situation, it's going to be really hard for the Russell 2000 to really get to all time highs. That being said, I do think small caps are still cheap nonetheless. Now looking at now let's look at the global earnings picture. So this is like the next 12 month earnings of the sectors right against the ACWI. So pretty much the all world index. It's like the developed market and emerging markets weighted for the country size in terms of their stock market size. So we got the S&P 500 versus the ACWI pretty much since November is tracking flat. Same with Europe. OK, and same with emerging markets, ex China tracking flat. So what does that mean? It pretty much means that if the ACWI is reporting earnings of 10 percent, OK, that Europe is also reporting that amount and the S&P 500 is also reporting that amount and emerging markets, ex China is also reporting that amount. If the S&P 500 was reporting more earnings, they would actually increase. If Europe was reporting more earnings, their amounts against the world index would increase. So what's this telling us? Earnings is robust across the board in emerging markets, developed markets and Europe, S&P 500, excluding China, obviously. But as we can see, unless we see a tangible divergence in any one of these in either direction, the earnings picture globally in the US and emerging markets is very very robust at the moment. And all in all, the global earnings picture is looking very robust. Now let's actually talk about earnings really, really quick. We have a big week of earnings tomorrow. AMD, Alphabet, Starbucks, Microsoft all reporting earnings after the bell, especially Pfizer and General Motors. SoFi reported earnings before the open, Super Micro reported earnings and SoFi's earnings were very, very good. They recorded gap profitability 
exceptional guidance. Stock was up 20%. SMCI reported earnings. They actually pre-reported their earnings about a week ago. Then they re-reported and raised guidance. And that's why they were up 4%. So they beat their pre-reported earnings and raised. But all eyes on Microsoft, Google, AMD tomorrow. Now let's talk seasonality guys. So we can see here that the median performance of the SPX and the SXXP during elections. And normally we get pretty muted action, uncertainty. And when we do get but then after election day, we then see a rally. Now looking at February more specific, February tends to be quite a bullish month up until the middle of the month. And then we do see downward price action. Just for the record, this right here tends to coincide with OPEX. So we could actually see like upward price action towards OPEX. And then maybe we look for sales at this point right here. And normally if you have a look at this and this, this should take us to about the 5,000 level. And that's why I'm expecting sell side to occur. And I think the market wants to go touch that psychological level. They want to go touch the 5,000 level. The market tends to do that. They like these big round numbers, you know, 4,800, 4,900, 5,000. Looking at gamma, the call gamma resistance continues to be at 4,900, but the 5,000 strike is building. That being said, a lot of positive gamma on the tape. And I do believe at the open tomorrow, there's going to be even more with what the Fed and the Treasury announced. Let's have a look at some charts. Look, there's not much to say with the S&P 500 other than the fact that I did. It did look like momentum was fading, but that candle right there, especially for the index, very, very strong at the high. And I do expect follow through to the 5000 level. And that's actually what I said on my weekend video looking at equal weight. Very, very strong for the equal weight. Now you're going to see a common theme in these charts, right? We got a high here, and then a low. Then we go print a higher high. You see some sell side downward, make a higher low. And now we're trying to break these highs. And the RSP is like a couple of cents away from doing that. We see follow through tomorrow and a close above. That's a higher high. And then we can go attack all time highs at about 165, 164 around there. Looking at the Russell 2000, very similar situation to the RSP. We made a low, we made a high, we made a lower high. And now, we're rallying towards this section right here. We've broken and closed above this key level of 198. And what the Russell needs to do now is go and attack the 205 level right here. Looking at super micro SMCI, super, super strong. Don't fade this. I mean, it did look like these were some ugly candles we were looking at up 4%, 4.5% today. Why are you going to fight the trend right here? It just seems that all dips are just getting bought up by this company. And for the record, this company trades in like 24 times. So it's still fairly cheap at these levels. Looking at SoFi, 20% up on the day, gap up. There was a bit of selling pressure, but I do expect the 10.45 level to be broken in the next couple of months for SoFi. I do expect further price action. All of their business segments are growing and growing above expectations. So I don't know what the valuation currently sits at, but I might dig into it. It's got quite a cult following on Twitter as well. Looking at DR Horton. So this is very, very interesting. This is a play I gave you guys on the weekend. And I said, we're going to be looking at shorts below here. If, if the treasury comes in and is very, very hawkish. Now the QRA announcement was in a sense dovish. Real estate as a whole did rally like 0.75%, but DR Horton was actually down 0.21%. So maybe there's weakness in the stock as a whole right here. Maybe they're exposed to the China real estate market. I'm not really sure, but this this is not constructive for bullish action, especially in the face of all of the positive macro news to see this type of price action probably means the stock is weak. We do go lower. And if we do break below here, we could look for shorts at about 131 stops at 142. That's a one to five risk to reward. Looking at Netflix, we are looking at a trade for Netflix. If Netflix does trade down to this 540 level, we will take it higher. But as it stands right now, it just keeps pushing up and we're not going to chase a trade. We're going to wait for a high probability setup and then take one. Now looking at TLT, we made a high, low, high, low, right on this downtrend. We broke above this high, put in here, and we haven't broken this low as of yet. So we make a higher low. Now what TLT needs to do is recapture this trend line and push above here. If it does that, that's going to be bullish, especially with the QRA announcement. That's going to be very, very bullish for, for treasuries as a whole. They were up 1.15% for the day. Now we just need follow through in these yield markets, especially now as we move into February and March. And we are definitely looking at rate cuts sooner rather than later. Looking at the dark pool activity, we saw huge prints come in here, here, and here. And this does look like accumulation. Price is at this high volume area right here. If we do break above here, there's not much volume to support on the way up easily see the stock run to the 96 level very, very quickly in even just a couple of days by the end of the week. 
Now looking at software, we did see last week a lot of gap ups and then sell the gap. Now we've broken right above. This is a very key level we've broken, close above. Now we can go attack 450 all time highs in software. Now looking at LVMH, we're at this 200 moving day after a 12% rally and a 0.71% rally today. All we need to do now is make substantial closes above, use our support, go higher, maybe get to this 900 level, a good psychological level. Looking at gold futures after the treasury announcement, essentially more debt is going to be issued and still a record people want a currency hedge and we are in like this wedge and it looks like we have broken out what we want to see is follow through up and then continuation higher and break above this high and then all-time highs and gold that's what we want to see but constructive price action i guess to go and attack the highs at the start of the year i gave you guys two portfolios top picks portfolios and my undervalued portfolio and you can go ahead on my twitter and have a look at all of them so if you just hop on my twitter and then you go to my profile hit the highlights tab right here you actually see that it's the this right here top undervalued picks for 2024 and then top stocks to hold i just want to show you how these portfolios have been performing this past year so 2024 top picks portfolio is up 18.13 percent year to date it's significantly beaten the s p 500 3.9 percent that's the s p 500 inside this portfolio quite concentrated it's just amd celsius holdings CrowdStrike holdings alphabet nvidia so very very concentrated in tech semiconductors and then one like beverage company looking at the second portfolio and this one is more of a risk averse more well diversified portfolio it's called my undervalued 2024 year to date it's up 8.49 percent outperforming the s p 500 here's the data now looking at what's inside the portfolio it was my opinion that the best performing sectors this year was actually going to be like tech and financials as well as healthcare but i don't really like investing in healthcare as a whole and that's what this portfolio consists of it's mostly just like payment service companies so we have pay you don't see it right here but there's charles schwab there is um, american express as well and then we do have like mostly just tech companies we have f5 beat on earnings by the way alphabet nvidia asml so mostly just tech and semiconductors and this portfolio is up 8.5 percent for the year so just something i thought you get guys make a note i do have a methodology for constructing this portfolio it's discretionary so it's not anything i choose it's just a whole bunch of screens and then based on a fair value estimate so looking at the week dating the week ahead just to refresh you guys on the 30th we have jolts that's important the 31st we got adp the fomc and on the first we got initial jobless claims some pmis ism and then on the second we have non-farms consumer sentiment and the major jobs report so everything to note there but the big one is just the employment report as well as fomc and some of this ism data pmi data is also important too but yeah that that's the big one fomc and the non-farms but if you've made it up until here guys thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell and like this video cheers